Hey everybody, welcome to my video on the critical wedge, an example from the Himalaya. This image, taken from the space shuttle, shows the vast expanse of the Tibetan plateau, stretching off north of the axis of the high Himalaya mountain range. And so if a geologist looks at this picture, we might ask a few questions. We know that the Himalaya are formed as India collided northward with Eurasia. But how did that collision actually unfold? What dictates how high this mountain range is? What controls how wide the mountain range is? And what controls the pattern of shortening along faults within the Himalaya mountain range? And a lot of the answers to these fundamental questions come from what's called critical wedge theory. So in this video, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the Himalaya. Then we're going to explain what the critical wedge theory is and how it predicts the shape and size and shortening dynamics of the Himalaya. And then we'll finish with an example of how focused orographic precipitation in the front of the Himalaya can actually change the shape and the dynamics of the critical wedge. So let's start out with a quick video to set the stage. We know the Himalaya happened as India collided northward with Asia. And notice what's happening right in here as they collide. Sediments are being scraped off the downgoing India plate, and they're being thickened and piled into this orogenic wedge, which is essentially a bunch of thrust faults that have scraped sediment off of India and thrust it southward out over the Indian craton. But some of the key elements here are that India is going under Asia and sediments are primarily being scraped off the Indian plate and thrust southward into this structural wedge. Now from map view or satellite view, what does that look like? Here's the entire India-Asia origin, which stretches over a wide area. And here's that north-south convergence as India moves northward going underneath Eurasia, and specifically underneath the Tibetan Plateau. And one of the takeaways here is essentially that uh, Tibet and Eurasia are a very thick lithosphere. And in this, this video, they're going to act as a rigid backstop. As India goes underneath and the sediments get scraped off, those sediments are going to get piled up against Tibet which can act like a big rigid backstop and cause this wedge of thrusts to grow southward instead of growing northward. And so in the subsequent slides in the video, we're going to be mostly visualizing this in a two-dimensional cross-section going north to south right through the central Himalaya. And we'll be looking at the structural architecture along this cross-section. So here's an example of that. Okay, here's south to north. Here comes the Indian lithosphere subducting northward under Eurasia. And the Himalaya are composed of four geologic belts that each essentially started out as sediment that was once deposited on the Indian lithosphere. So moving northward, or south to north, in the southern part of the Himalaya, we have what's called the sub-Himalayan series, essentially a bunch of slates that were only lightly buried before being exhumed along the southernmost thrusts. Coming a bit further north, we have the lesser Himalayan series, a bunch of schists that have been exhumed from more deep depths and have therefore been metamorphosed to the higher grade of schist instead of slate. Coming yet further north, we get to the greater Himalayan series, this is a bunch of gneisses that have been buried to great depths and pressures and temperatures and have come back to the surface from these deep depths and they are deeply metamorphosed as gneisses. So notice we're getting generally progressively higher metamorphism as we move northward into the orogenic wedge. However, when we cross over this fault, the South Tibetan Fault, we move into what's called the Tethian Sedimentary Series. This is a bunch of very lightly metamorphosed sedimentary rocks 
that were essentially scraped off India very early and have been riding high on top of the Himalaya thrust pile and have essentially avoided major metamorphism by sitting up high on top of the Himalaya. So those are the four geologic belts. And you're already getting the idea that these are separated by four major fault zones. And I'll quickly mention those. The main frontal thrust out front, the main boundary thrust, the main central thrust, and the South Tibetan detachment. The South Tibetan detachment deserves special mention because although it's currently an extensional normal fault, it's actually stripping the Tethian series off to the north, it started out life as a thrust. But as thrusting moved southward in the Himalaya over time, the South Tibetan detachment actually was extinct for a while and then was reactivated as an extensional normal fault as the Himalaya actually got so high, they got higher than Tibet, and these sedimentary rocks started to fall off northward along the South Tibetan detachment. And just to visualize that, here's a view from the window of an airplane uh, looking essentially westward at one of the high peaks of the Himalaya, Dalagiri. The high, many of the high peaks of the Himalaya are actually made of Tethian sedimentary series rocks, essentially unmetamorphosed sedimentary rocks, and many of them are being dropped northward along uh, faults associated with the South Tibetan detachment. Okay, so this is being extended northward. Um, so that's a great example of the high Himalayan geology. So coming back to one of our original questions, you now know something about the architecture of the Himalaya. What caused this architecture to evolve? And how are these different faults working together to accommodate shortening today? Well, one of the things we know, both from GPS and from geologic study, is that most of the shortening across the Himalaya is accommodated on the, the main frontal thrust this is the youngest thrust, and it's the one that's sitting on the most southern tip of the Himalaya. Okay, And we know this is about 21 millimeters per year of shortening, which is almost the entire shortening budget that we, that we have from GPS across the Himalaya. So why is shortening focused at the range front? And, in, and even more deep than that, why are there multiple thrusts to begin with? Why isn't the whole Himalaya just coming out on one thrust zone? Why did we develop these thrusts over time? And why is shortening focused on the main frontal thrust today? Well, this brings us to the critical wedge concept. And this is going to help us think about how the Himalaya thrust belt evolved. So first, I'll summarize this idea. As an orogenic wedge grows, well, well first of all, Note that all of these thrust belts, these thrusts, essentially have thickened the Himalayan crust so that it's thicker in the north and a little bit thinner in the south. This is what we call an orogenic wedge. Okay, It's a wedge that gets thicker to the north. And the way this thing formed is that as compression happened, we first had thrusting in the back of the range. For example, the South Tibetan detachment may have been one of the first thrusts to be active. However, when these thrusts can no longer slip, we get new thrust faults that break out in the south. Then when those can't slip, the process repeats itself and we generate new thrusts and then more new thrusts to the south. So the wedge grows as thrusts in the rear die and new thrusts break out progressively towards the front of the wedge. And let's take a quick minute and watch a video of this, which is an analog video from a sandbox experiment. OK, what you're going to see here is essentially Tibet in the back, acting as a rigid backstop. In this case, we're going to move Tibet forward, but that's really the same thing as moving India northward. And as Tibet moves this way, you're going to see these sedimentary layers get scraped off the bottom 
and we're going to see thrust faults forming and we're going to see the orogenic wedge start to thicken. Here we go. There's the first thrust, maybe the South Tibetan detachment. Here comes another and another. When that gets too thick, it's going to break again. Boom. And notice these thrusts keep breaking out towards the, the foreland or towards the southern tip of the wedge. As the thrusts in the rear get too thick, new thrusts break out to the south. And the end result is that we actually are left with a wedge-shaped geometry in which there's multiple thrusts supporting that have ramped material up. And the youngest, most active thrusts are out at the front of the wedge. Okay. So returning to our lecture, why does this happen? What are the physics that govern this critical wedge? Well, we need to have a couple prerequisites. First, we need to have a material that can be relatively easily faulted and deformed. Okay? And sediments lend themselves to this. They're relatively soft. If you imagine you had a big granite batholith like the Sierra Nevada, it's a lot harder to break new faults through hard, unfractured granite. So we don't often see wedges within granitic rocks. Usually wedges form within metasedimentary rocks that can be easily faulted and deformed. Another prerequisite or requirement is that we need to have a weak basal ramp. We sometimes call this a ramp, sometimes call it a decolmant or a detachment, but essentially this whole pile of thrust sheets has to be riding along a weak decolmant or ramp. This can sometimes be a, a particularly weak sedimentary layer that allows a fault to break along it and for other thrusts to pop up from within it. And then finally, we need a rigid backstop. In this case, uh, our backstop is Tibet. That's essentially acting as a snow plow, pushing up a pile of snow in front of it with the wedge growing ever wider as you push forward. And so let's look now at what controls the pattern of faulting within the wedge. Essentially, thrust faults are fractures in the wedge where one block is trying to slip past and over the underlying block. And in order for these two blocks to slide past each other, we need to have a favorable ratio of shear stress, which is the stress parallel to the fault, versus normal stress, which is the stress perpendicular to the fault. And it's that normal stress that's acting to essentially pinch the two blocks of the fault together and prevent sliding. Now, because thrust faults tend to be at a, a relatively low angle, shear stress tends to be derived primarily from tectonic compression, whereas the normal stress tends to be derived primarily from the lithostatic stress, or the, the overburden. Essentially, the thicker the rocks get above the fault, the more normal stress is acting to pin those two sides of the fault together. So if we think about that in the context of faults in a wedge, what we can see is that as the wedge develops, faults in the rear of the wedge end up being essentially trapped under a thicker amount of overburden, which creates a very high normal stress on those faults and eventually causes them to lock up or stall. They essentially end up carrying so much overburden that they just can't carry it. They can't slide forward under that weight. So what happens then is it becomes favorable for faults, new faults to break out closer to the toe of the wedge where there's far less overburden and a new fault can actually break out with relatively low normal stresses because there's relatively little overburden. And so this is how, this is what causes the wedge to advance forward as these faults in the rear essentially accumulate overburden, become locked, and then new faults break out in front with less overburden. And it turns out this is exactly what's happening in the Himalaya. If we look at our orogenic or critical wedge in the Himalaya, we have four major fault systems 
most of which are relatively inactive. And we see that all of the shortening is accommodated on the main frontal thrust. And we know now that's because this is the youngest thrust. This is the one that just broke out at the front of the wedge and is able to slip more easily because it has less overburden on top of it. In contrast, the main boundary thrust, just to its north, is essentially extinct, probably sitting there at a critical state. And that brings me to the final part of the lecture, orographic precipitation and out-of-sequence thrusting. So to understand out-of-sequence thrusting, let's go back to the idea of the critical wedge. Why do we call it critical? It's critical because faults in the rear of the wedge are just barely below the stress threshold required to slip. These faults were slipping along, everything was fine, and then at one point their overburden became large enough and the normal stress became large enough that they couldn't slip forward anymore and they stopped. However, if we reduce that normal stress load, or if we increase the shear stress, those faults can slip again. And that would be called out of sequence thrusting, when a fault towards the rear of the wedge slips again, after active thrusting has already moved towards the front of the wedge. And this out of sequence thrusting can happen if we erode the rear of the wedge. And in fact, this commonly does happen. One example is in the Himalaya, where we have focused rainfall on the back part of the wedge, which is essentially driving fluvial and glacial erosion, removing material from the rear of the wedge, and allowing some of these faults to reactivate in an out of sequence sense. So here's what this looks like. Imagine super intense monsoon flooding in the rivers of Pakistan, or huge valley glaciers fed by massive winter snowfalls. Both of these are removing material very, very quickly and essentially unloading these faults in the rear of the wedge. And where is this precipitation and thus erosion focused? It's focused right up against the steepest part of the Himalayan wedge. And we call this orographic precipitation. Essentially, as monsoon clouds flow north and they rise up and over the Himalaya, they dump their most intense precipitation right against the steep topographic front, which is roughly co-located with the location of the main central thrust. So as materials removed, from above the main central thrust, it's able to slip again, and we're able to essentially draw rocks up from depth and out along the main central thrust very, very quickly by out of sequence thrusting. So if you remember the beginning of this lecture, you'll remember that the high Himalaya series was actually where we found the highest grade metamorphic rock, or these gneisses that have been drawn out by this process. Further evidence for out of sequence thrusting in the Himalaya comes from fission track thermochronology, which also shows very rapid exhumation above the main central thrust. The way this works is a fission track age essentially records the amount of time since the rock cooled through 100 degrees Celsius. So these rocks above the main central thrust have traveled upwards from 100 degrees Celsius in less than half a million years. Very, very quickly, they've come from a hot place up to the surface. In contrast, rocks out in the, the tip of the wedge or out to the south of the wedge have taken up to 4 million years to transit the, the last few kilometers of crust. So this, this is further evidence for out of sequence thrusting in the rear of the wedge. So in summary, this video has shown that critical wedges develop when sediments are scraped off a plate, often during continent-continent collision. As thrust faults grow within the wedge, they carry heavier and heavier loads, 
which increases their normal stress and eventually causes them to stall or become critical. When this happens, new faults break out at the front of the wedge that have less overburden and are less restricted by normal stresses on the fault zone. However, thrusts in the rear of the wedge can be reactivated by out-of-sequence thrusting if the overburden is removed by erosion. I'll leave you with these two concept questions, and thanks for listening.